Ladies and gentlemen, a very, very, very warm welcome to the absolute heart of Trinity. So, uh, my name is Helen Shenton. I've got the enormous privilege of being the librarian and college archivist here at Trinity. Um, and the long room, as you know, is often called the most beautiful room in Ireland. Some people say it's the most beautiful room in the world. Uh, but you're very, very, very welcome to this, um, to this evening event. Um, I should say that part of the library's remit is to be the institutional memory of Trinity. Um, and we've been the custodians of the, um, uh, the archives of the HIST since the mid-60s. And they form a very important part of the college archives. And um, one of the most significant items in the archive is Burke's Minute Book, which is um, in the exhibition. This volume of meetings of the Edmund, Burke, um, Edmund Burke's Debating Society of 1747, it inspired the foundation of the College Historical Society. Um, and as I say, it's here on display. And this exhibition, um, it was a wonderful collaboration um, involving current students of the HIST um, and the library. Um, I'd particularly like to thank my colleagues um, Ellen O'Flaherty in research collections and Jill Whelan in digital collections uh, and uh, uh, Clona uh, Nelligan in conservation. And it was led by Ursula, Ursula Quill, the uh, director of HIS 250, who we'll um, hear from shortly. It's been a really successful um, student library co-curation uh, co co of this project in the long room. Um, the HIST actually have taken very good care of their record, records and indeed the quality of their record keeping over the years has been pretty good. In fact, Ellen, um, who is a professional archivist, she says it's superb. <laughs> I've never heard anyone say that before. <laughs> um, so the, the library as, as custodian of the records, we've preserved them and we've made them accessible and the HIST continues to transfer the records to the library. And the challenge now faced by any society and indeed anyone concerned with looking after um, lasting uh, recorded um, legacy of any activities is actually the curation and preservation of born digital records. And the library is working very hard to meet this enormous challenge and we hope the HIST will continue um, its fruitful relationship with us in the future. So anyway, um, we have three uh, wonderful speakers for you this evening and I'm absolutely thrilled to be um, introducing our first speaker, uh, Professor Mary McAleese. Um, Professor McAleese um, studied law at Queen's University Belfast. She was Reed Professor of Criminal Law here at Trinity. Um, she was obviously president of the country twice. <laughs> and we're absolutely thrilled that last November, uh, Professor McAleese was elected the Chancellor of the University of Dublin. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, uh, Professor McAleese. Good evening, everyone. How are you? Oh, only one person is good. Is that <laughs> one? Ooh, try that again. How are you? Re reassure me in the current climate. Um, ladies and gentlemen, it's good to be in your company this evening and in such a wonderful place and on such a fantastic occasion with a great purpose to it. Um, I'm just thinking that it's very likely that there are numerous deceased members of the HIST, um, some with very famous names and stellar careers, um, who are revolving in their graves at the thought of this gathering, marking the publication of uh, the College Historical Society's 250-year narrative with this wonderful book, this remarkable tome which is so readable, and with the fabulous exhibition. Um, the reason I think that they could be revolving in their graves probably is because, um, well, that it's being launched by a woman who also happens to be the Chancellor of the University, uh, given that the HIST resisted for 200 of its 250 years the admission of women to membership. Um, <laughs> Possibly even more shocking to some of them might be the fact that when um, the history of the HIST was to be commissioned, it was a UCD graduate who was asked, <laughs> who was commissioned to write the history. Also, I have to say, a Trinity professor. Um, and those who chose the eminent Patrick Gagan uh, to undertake what has to have been a fascinating but also a very laborious task, uh, they chose well. Uh, because he is an absolutely first-rate storyteller 
um, and the Hist has any number of stories that are worth telling. So Patrick has written an outstanding narrative of an outstanding phenomenon, the Hist itself. Um, first student university debating society in the world, we claim, um, where if we um, look at the, um, we've heard about the meticulous, um, the meticulous archives, but um, its archives are sometimes rather casually and sometimes meticulously strewn with a litany of famous and infamous names that soar across um, all others and above all others and right across the very convoluted chronicle um, of Irish history. Uh, their lives, their times, their passions, their prejudices come to life um, in these pages, I have to say, with a colour and a flair that makes this a book you simply you can't put down, you don't want to put down. It's also, I think, very timely that we have this publication uh, with its focus on the power um, and the value of intense debates, of discussion, persuasion and oratory um, at what we might describe, I think rightly, as another watershed moment in Irish history. And that we do have this work and that we have this wonderful exhibition, but that we do have this book um, is thanks to the support of the Trinity Trust, uh, the editorial skills of Ross Hines, the publishers, Hines and the Lilliput Press, um, but ultimately the formidable forensic flair of the author and, of course, the genius of our archivists and our historians here. Um, in this week that is dedicated to the Hist, um, so many of its famous members, speakers, debates and dramas They've already been called back to memory, and um, I think anybody who has had the chance to see the wonderfully um, evocative and excellently curated exhibition, um, now along with the book, um, will know what a parade of retrospection um, now is available to a much wider and a, and a contemporary audience. The great thing about this book, of course, is that it brings us right up to contemporary names uh, from from right from the, the far reaches of the past to today. I have to say, everybody's going to have their favourite story. Of course they are. Uh, but my favourites are the seminal role played by Dr Michael Carney, um, an ancestor of President Barack Obama, um, in the foundation of the HIST in 1770. And the equally seminal role played by uh, the Society's treasurer, County Down man Robert Ross, uh, in 1812, um, who was responsible, of course, for the burning down of the White House, uh, mercifully before <laughs> Barack Obama arrived, obviously. Um, and um, I don't know if James Hoban had any relationship with the Hist or with Trinity, but it is interesting that Ross, in burning down the White House, which had been um, essentially built or designed by an Irishman, created work for James Hoban in the redesigning and the rebuilding. So there was a benefit to Ireland both ways, I would have thought. Um, also, I passed the Ross Mo Monument uh, just outside Rostrever very often, and believe me, it's still keeping people in work. Um, I won't attempt to paraphrase at all or describe the legendary theatrics of the Hist or the cast of Dramatis Personae who were involved in its debates, its excommunications, its splits, dissolutions, Friendships, enmities, rows, ructions, pushes, shoves, punches, its tragic deaths, its injustices, its fallow times, its spectacular times. Um, as David McConnell has observed, you could not make it up. Um, but two perspectives, I think, help us to understand that it wasn't just um, a transitory, superficial, elitist talk shop, but it was a place of real encounter, usually with the terrified self. Um, in his poem, Hist, commissioned for this occasion, uh, former Hist star and dazzling international poet, uh, Michal O'Shale, whom we welcome here with his wife, Christina, here, uh, he describes it as the arena where we found our feet. And everybody, anybody who ever spoke in the Hist will know exactly what that means. It echoes the words of Marianne Elliott in her work in Wolf Tone when she said of it that historically it was the training ground for almost all the leading political figures in the age of Grattan's Parliament. But frankly, you could pick any age in the last two and a half centuries, and you could probably pick any field. And the same could be said, not just of politicians, but of writers, poets, philosophers, lawyers, activists of all sorts, and many others because 
It was the pulpit. It was the platform. It was the bear pit. It is Ireland's Hyde Park corner, a missile launch pad for ideas and theories, notions, beliefs, the greenhouse where the seeds of the future were sown and grown. It was the glass house where stones were thrown, sometimes thrown back. Um, it was the place where shapes were thrown, reputations made, reputations unmade. It was a war zone, but the ammunition was words, opinions, challenges, exhortations, deprecations, incantations. It was the battleground from which men and more latterly women took their bruised or their flattered egos. It was, importantly, the field hospital where nerves were cauterised and steel was put in spines and wobbly legs were steadied, where people developed the thick skin that you need to endure the public gaze. It unblocked the dry throats, the choked throats, it let the words flow. In the hist, people who rose to speak often died a thousand deaths, um, but as Mee Hall said, they found their feet. And at the hist debates, a thousand weird ideas were floated, touted, they were disputed, they were discounted, of course, unless they involved the equality of women. Um, a thousand good ideas you know, were skimmed um, like stones in a flat pond surface, they rippled out into city, into community, into country, taking their time to germinate, including in the hist itself. Decades before Ireland's laws opened up to things like women's rights, gay rights, reproductive rights, divorce, these issues were debated and disputed long and hard on the floor of the hist. And they fed minds, they helped to open minds, and in time, they let the future in. So in this book, this wonderful book, there is an accessible treasure trove of talent, of once unknown names who were to become legends, of speeches that were average and speeches that were magnificent, of Ireland moving through the generations, changing, changing, talking, talking, slowly becoming the Ireland imagined by so many past heroes and heroines, morphing into this intriguing, wealthy, egalitarian, multicultural European Republic it is today. And if the hist seems to have, as it does in its early days, um, an obsession with rules and laws, like God, they're like canon lawyers, um, <laughs> rules and regulations, um, if it seems a little bit arcane, and actually it does, and precious, it's actually worth remembering that in its rules and protocols, its procedures and practices, that's in a way what allows the archivist to say of the archive that it is superb. They took the traditions and the rituals and the event itself seriously. And that became the mesh and the meld that gave it its longevity. They helped to make sure that the hist was and remains, however heated be times, what Patrick describes very importantly, as a safe space in which to send public messages and advance ideas, helping to advance debate on the major issues of the day. For it's always been about ideas that are fleshed out by the quality of oratory, not cheap demagoguery, though I'm sure there was some of that at times too, um, about the power, but that was always the other people, wasn't it? Um, <laughs> but about the power of persuasion, not coercion, about listening to contradictory views, about breaking out of echo chambers, testing ideas and opinions with the tools of the intellect, the weapon of the intellect, letting those ideas run so that they either died or they lived on their merits. And so this book is a tour of that very particular history, as is the exhibition. And this evening, I just want to call to memory 13 young men, don't worry, I'm not going to name them because I can't remember their names myself, but who met in Trinity one evening in 1770, and they will have put out 13 seats for the first meeting for their small audience. And they wrote the attendees' name in the book, they recorded the event, and they probably didn't record it for posterity for us, but just probably for the next week or the next month. And in very uncertain circumstances, because remember, the university did not, did not welcome the hist. 
Um, in very uncertain circumstances, they had the courage to open that book that was just then full of blank pages and to start filling them. And so that's what we also gather here tonight to celebrate, the courage of those first 13. Uh, I wonder what they would make of this Ireland of ours, this uh, partitioned Ireland where tens of thousands now go to university from every conceivable background. And what would they make of the fact that if you look at some of the debates over the years, even going back 200 years, how familiar some of them would be even today. Yet, the truth is, there is a new Irish landscape in the making. Um, I think it was probably best articulated in the HIST many years ago um, by the greatest orator and Irish statesman of my lifetime, John Hume, um, when, and I remember this particular occasion well, as a mesmerising guest speaker, he drew with words the image of a peaceful pluralist Ireland, a reconciled Ireland, a politically healthy island of Ireland, free from the grip of sectarianism and confessional politics, which had estranged neighbour from neighbour, created injustice, created division. He created this image of this egalitarian island, which would be a sign of contradiction in a world dominated so often by the unhealthy power politics of greed, of sexism, elitism, exclusion and injustice. Well, Ireland has changed and Trinity has changed and the HIST has changed wonderfully from the first debate on the Irish question in 1779. And Hall, in his poem, suggests that we look back with gratitude, and he's absolutely right, how lucky we were and are to have this formidable legacy and to have it documented so brilliantly by Patrick. But I think we can also allow ourselves the indulgence of looking forward with gratitude to the heterogeneous generation that has custody of the future. They are going to be extraordinary. How many languages they will speak, how many cultures they draw from today. Um, yes, hopefully the tomorrow of the hist uh, will be a place that honours fully the open-minded, tolerant character of Henry Duquerry. Did I get his name right? How was he pronounced? Duquerry? Yeah. yeah. The founder of the College Historical Society. Not a household name yet, but maybe we, we could maybe start that tonight. Um, because he helped to craft its character um, from the outset as a place that savoured debate, respected all who offered opinions, reserved the right of members to make their own minds up after the issues had been debated and deliberated, and charted also in the book, and it's very important to remind ourselves, charted also in the book, to great effect, is how the hist so often over the years changed its mind, its collective mind about things. So I think we're entitled to say that the hist has found its own feet and its continuing relevance in a much altered word, world um, of both college and country. And now it has a job, I think, to do to introduce all of us to the new voices which will craft the ideas and the discussions that will also shape the new Ireland. Um, I, hope they I hope the exhibition will inspire a lot of them um, to come out from behind the bunker of the blog um, or the triteness of the tweet. Um, and in Lee Hall's words, uh, which I think are wonderful, his very telling words, brazen out the wag and heckler's jeer to become interns in the hothouse of debate. Isn't that a lovely thought? I have to say, reading that, those words the, the, about the hecklers and the jeers, I could feel my own self going back to the first time I spoke and the sea legs wobbling um, underneath me. And that's the great gift that many of us look back on the hist and are grateful for, the opportunity, the opportunity to speak, the opportunity to grow in ourselves, to lose the fear of ourselves. That's what we lost, the faith in ourselves, the confidence we got in ourselves. What a wonderful gift that has been to so many. Thank you. Chancellor, thank you. That was so lyrical, a lyrical evocation of, um, of the hist. Thank you so much for your, for your words. Um, so, ladies and gentlemen, I now want to um, introduce you to um, the director of HIST 
250. So Ursula Quill, she's a graduate of Trinity and UCD. Um, she was auditor of the HIST, um, and she's currently undertaking barrister at law degree at King's Inn, and she's working as a political assistant to um, Senator um, Ivana Bacic. Um, so, ladies and gentlemen, please um, give a huge uh, welcome to Ursula Quinn, the uh, director of HIST 250. Ursula. Thank you, Helen, for that very kind introduction. Chancellor, um, distinguished guests, a horde of galere. It's such a pleasure to be able to speak today to you to open the His 250 exhibition. I've had the great pleasure to direct His 250, but I have to say, on an ongoing basis, um, co curating the His 250 exhibition has been such a pleasure and, and a real joy. It has been a collaborative effort between students on the HIST committee, and they're here at the front of the hall and uh, of, of this wonderful, splendid room, and, uh, and the manuscripts room of the Library of Trinity College. And it's been a real joy working with, with your staff, Helen, on that project. Um, we, had, uh, we, were, we were really honoured to have uh, President Higgins uh, be the very first visitor to the exhibition uh, just before he opened HIST 250 on Monday evening and he took a great interest in the range of records that are on display. Uh, as you will see in the cases, and also in the booklet accompanying the exhibition, the records of the HIST which are held in the library include minute books, attendance books, medals, composition books, photographs, and correspondence. The students involved in curating this exhibition, uh, Ben McConkey, Julie Nunan, Ben Ryan, Maggie Larson, and the auditor, Luke Feheli, had a great vision for an exhibition which would demonstrate the HIST as a student society, first and foremost, from its very foundation right up to the present day. And I, I, I really think that that has, that has come forward in, in the cases. Uh, each of them left their stamp on the exhibition. Um, I, I thought I just might point out a couple of the, the highlights, but I think, I think the, whole, the whole exhibition does tell its own story. H Helen has already referred, of course, to, to Burke's Minute Book, and in many ways this is, it's doubly significant in the exhibition. It's Burke's own, own hand, and of course it was Burke's Debating Club of 1747, which inspired the Hist's foundation. But furthermore, it was the book itself that was presented to the board by Mr. Ducari and by uh, the, the very um, uh, long-sighted Michael Carney, Dr. Michael Carney, with the proposal that a debating society be established. On Wednesday this week, we, we marked that very first meeting of 13 students in the senior common room, where they were very kindly given permission to use the, the college rooms. And I think that book, and that, that first meeting, which is imprinted on the cover of the exhibition booklet, it demonstrates the long connection between the HIST as a student society and the university and Trinity College. The 19th century attendance books paints a picture of notable Trinity students, Bram Stoker, Edward Carson, Oscar Wilde, who was a visiting student from the Ox Oxford Union, a corresponding society, engaging with the HIST on a, on a diverse range of, of debates, and as the Chancellor has already mentioned, debates which seem to be recurring in every generation, um, changing social status of women in society, separation of church and state, and they're debating all of these issues uh, throughout the, the 18th and 19th century. We also have a number of items marking the admission of women to the HIST just 51 years ago, Earlier today, we were very fortunate to be able to unveil a wonderful portrait by Mick O'Dee, who is here, of uh, Mary Harney, the very first woman auditor of the HIST. And there's a, there's a wonderful uh, photograph of Rosalind Mills, who was the first woman to address the society to a packed chamber uh, in 1969. And, um, of course, we, we also have uh, some of the items from the bicentenary, and I'm delighted that we have many 
many members of the HIST who were involved in putting the Bicentenary Programme together here with us this week. It's, it's a real privilege to be able to meet with you and, and share this week with you. And I hope that the work that we've done this week will inspire the students in 50 years' time to, to put on an even bigger programme. Uh, so, no, it's, it's, been, it's, been a real, it's been a real privilege. And, um, and as I say, I think the, 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 key, the key message we wanted to get across was how um, the HIST has always been very much a student society which takes its debate seriously, but is also a forum for the exchange of ideas uh, for informal conversations and debates. And one of the things which I know the students really enjoyed was seeing how in even the 18th and 19th century, the, um, the, the levity of a lot of the, the records. So we have suggestion books from the 19th century with humorous suggestions for the library. We have satirical poems in the composition and medal books of the 18th century. And it just shows how from the very start, yes, these were, these were students like Wolf Tone and Robert Emmett who would go on to achieve remarkable things. But at the end of the day, they were students and they were undergraduates. And that really shines through as well. And of course, our very last item in the exhibition mirrors this remarkable room and is a reflection of the entire committee of the 250th session. So it's the historical of this very committee. So we really wanted to show the, the ongoing significance of the HIST. So just, just again to thank everyone who was, who was involved in making this exhibition possible. It was amazing working with the, the, the students members of committee who were so dedicated to making this exhibition possible. We had many long hours in the manuscripts room and working with the, the team at the library to make this possible. Um, special mention as well to the support of TCD Association and Trust, who have been so supportive of HIS 250 in general. Um, the entire staff of the library who have been made this all possible. And I suppose the, 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 the key thing was how it created a forum for, for students to engage with that history, the rich history, um, and, and to create real kind of deep and, and lasting, lasting friendships. And um, I would like to, I suppose finally, and I suppose very particularly, we, we, we would like to acknowledge the very, um, the very dedicated and um, uh, really, we, we owe an immense de debt of gratitude to Ellen O'Flaherty, who has been mentioned, but she was the archivist who worked very closely with us on this exhibition. Uh, her dedication and enthusiasm to the HIST archives knew no bounds uh, and, and uh, very, very, worked very late into the night to make this, this possible. And uh, I, I remember meeting her about a year and a half ago when most of the, a lot of archives still had to be transferred over from the GMB and I knew straight away that the, we had somebody who understood and, and got the hist. And it's been an absolute pleasure working, working with you. Um, so I, I'd like to invite uh, the curation team uh, to assist. We have a, a very small token of appreciation um, for the work. If Ellen would like to come to the front, we would like to... Um, we would like to share our appreciation. And just, just honestly, thank you so much to Ellen and to everyone at the library because this was really a, a, a remarkable collaboration between, between the HIST and the library and I think uh, um, uh, uh, very fruitful and we're, we're very grateful. Oh, yeah. <laughs>
Thank you. Thank you, Ursula. That was, that was beautiful. And uh, I should say that last week, um, we have very strict security here in the, in the old library. Um, and I got a phone call, um, and Ellen had been locked in <laughs> at night <clears throat> as we locked up. Um, just to show you her dedication to, to, to duty. And students, I think I mentioned to you, do not underestimate the value of being able to put on your CV that you co-curated an exhibition in the long room. So now, to my um, great delight and somewhat surprise, um, I'd like to introduce um, Professor pa uh, Patrick Gagan, the um, author of the new history of the society um, uh, called Trinity College Dublin, the College Historical Society, Oratory and Debate 1770 to 2020. Um, the reason I'm slightly surprised was I was briefed that um, he's about, or his wife is about to give um, birth to their second child, and that if the phone goes, um, he might disappear. Um, but we're absolutely delighted to have you, Patrick. Um, so Patrick is Professor in Modern History um, here in Trinity. Um, we lost him for a little while as speechwriter and researcher for the Taoiseach, um, Leo Varadkar. He presents the weekly history program, Talking History on News Talk uh, Radio, um, and um, I'd like to, um, you to give a very warm welcome to um, Professor Patrick Gagan. Thank you. Uh, Chancellor, Pro-Chancellor, uh, Provost, uh, auditor, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, as the librarian has said, I did not think I would be here. Uh, I thought I would be in the maternity hospital, but on a deeper level, I didn't think I would be here because for a long time, I feared the book would not be finished <laughs> on time. And it was 10 years ago that the president, David McConnell, and the auditor of the time, Jamie Walsh, uh, commissioned this volume. And 10 years is a very long time in the world of history, and I immediately accepted, thinking that this would not be a major problem. Uh, and uh, I was delighted to take on the challenge of writing the history because although I've never been a member of the society, I've, I've, I've chaired meetings, and I have such a huge respect and admiration for the society and the role it's played in Trinity and in Irish life and beyond. Uh, unfortunately, three people intervened uh, to make the project difficult, if not seemingly impossible. Uh, the first person I blame is the provost, <laughs> who asked me to become his first senior lecturer, Dean of Undergraduate Studies, which took three years out of the project. The second person is my wife, Olivia, who gave me much more interesting and enjoyable things to concern myself with, including our beautiful daughter, Ellie. Uh, the third person is, as we mentioned, the Taoiseach, and uh, when I became a special advisor three years ago, the book was half written. And I'm afraid the last three years have given me more stress about the completion of the book than Brexit, the coronavirus, <laughs> or anything else I have, uh, that we've been dealing with. And there are some people who really made such a huge difference in, in rescuing the project. And I'm particularly grateful to the Trinity Trust because their support really has been uh, instrumental. I'm very grateful to Dr. Timothy Murta, who worked with me as a research assistant. I'm particularly grateful to Ellen O'Flaherty, who's been honored tonight because she has been so brilliant to deal with, and Tim, uh, working with her, found her uh, so brilliant working through those archives. And because I didn't think I would be here tonight, I asked a former auditor, Adrian Langan, uh, to speak on my behalf. And I asked Adrian because he has been someone who I've had many, many conversations with about the society over those past 10 years. And his enthusiasm for the society, his ideas, his inspiration has also uh, helped guide me during the work on this. And if I could not have been here, I think of no better person who could have spoken uh, on behalf of the book. And I think there are so many figures who I've come across in the society who represent and epitomize what the society is all about. But it is people like Adrian, people who believe in the power of the spoken word, people who believe in contesting ideas and listening and respecting to different ideas, and people who believe most of all in the power of the democratic process. 
in putting your ideas to the test, in putting them to a vote, and then by standing by that decision. And I've learned so much from my conversations uh, with Adrian, and I'm very grateful to him uh, for all his advice and his support. Uh, I am glad that I have been able to make it here today, uh, and particular, particularly to have been there this afternoon for the unveiling of the portraits, and to meet with the daughter of one of the people being honored, Jaja Wachuku, and his, some of his extended family. Because Jaja Wachuku isn't just a medalist of the society and one of the great figures in the society's history. I think he's one of the great graduates in the history of the University of Dublin, one of our greatest graduates. Uh, as we heard earlier, the first foreign minister of Nigeria, someone pl who played a pivotal role in the independence of his country, but also someone who played a much larger role when Nelson Mandela was put on trial in 1963 and 1964, the South African government were pressing for the death penalty. And it was Jaja Wachuku who brought together an international coalition and put pressure on the government to ensure that he was not executed. And scholars of Nelson Mandela have credited Jaja Wachuku and his oratory with saving the life of Nelson Mandela. And Wachuku became one of the fierce opponents of apartheid and worked against it in the 1960s and in the 1970s. And it's fitting that in the portrait that is now hanging in the conversation room in the GMB, he is wearing the traditional Nigerian dress because that is what he wore when he attended and spoke at meetings of the College Historical Society. But it is not what he wore when he was attending meetings of the United Nations or when he was sitting around the cabinet table. There he wore the Trinity tie. <laughs> and I think it was such a privilege for me to meet his daughter and to meet with members of his family and that we were able to honor someone who perhaps is a forgotten figure in terms of the history of the society, but who is not a forgotten figure in Africa or in the history of his own country. And there are so many figures like that who received their training in oratory in the College Historical Society and they took that training and they set out and they transformed the world. <laughs> there are people who we should honour here tonight. I think Ursula Quill is someone who has been such an incredible director of His 250. I have no doubt that in a number of years' time, when Miku D is currently working on brilliant new portraits of people like Robert Emmett and Bram Stoker and so on, and in a few more years, there will be portraits of people like Ursula Quill, Sally Rooney, and other of the great figures of the modern era of the society. And I think her work and the work of the committee, I think, is to be applauded. And when the historian in 50 years' time writes a new history, I think Luke Fahelly and his committee this year uh, will be applauded for leading the society uh, through a brilliant 250th year. And our congratulations to them as well. My thanks to Ross Hines, who is an absolute pleasure to work with, to Anthony Farrell and to Lilliput Press and Hines, uh, who I think did an absolutely brilliant job with the book. And I think by including the, the portraits of Mick Udi, by including Mihola Shiel's beautiful poem, I think those pieces of art, that, that, that beautiful poetry, has elevated a, a historical text into something uh, much more profound. And I'm so grateful and so honoured that their work has been included in the volume, and I thank them for that. I'd also like to thank the Chancellor of our university, who appears in the book. Uh, <laughs> Uh, in chapters long before uh, we ever thought she would be the Chancellor, because of course when she was Reed Professor, uh, she often chaired and spoke at meetings of the Society, and as President of Ireland came back and delivered one of the finest speeches in the history of the Society here in, I think, 1997. And you can tell from her, her brilliant oration tonight the power of her words and her, el and her, el and her eloquence. And we saw it when she was President of Ireland. We see it now when she is Chancellor. And we are so proud and we are so honoured uh, that she has represented us on the world stage and now is Chancellor. The book is not 
a study of any individual or any one year. You could have written an entire book about any single decade. There is so much rich material for the 1960s, the 1970s, the 1930s, the events of the 19th century or the 18th century. So it can only capture some of the themes and some of the individual, individuals. Because really it's the biography of the society, of the debates, of the ideas that were being explored, of the people who were involved, and of how they contributed to the, to the life of Ireland and to the world. And it still contributes with individuals with those ideas. And I think that is the great power of the society, that it is something that inspires people, not in the great moments of the great speeches, but in all the little moments, the times when you lose an argument, when you lose a debate, when things don't go right, the things you learn from hearing other points of view, the things you reflect on afterwards, that I think the transformational effect of societies like the Hist is not any one individual moment, but the accumulation of all of those friendships you make, the people you come across, the ideas you hear, and, and the influence and effect it has on you afterwards. And, and for me, that's always what I've admired so much about the society, what I think has been so great about it over the past 200 years, and why I think it will continue to be such an important part of Irish life and Trinity life for the next 250. Thank you. Thank you so much, Patrick. So, um, ladies and gentlemen, enjoy the exhibition, enjoy the book, enjoy a drink. Um, and on your behalf, I would just like to thank again um, what wonderful eloquence of our three speakers. Um, Ursula, congratulations. Patrick, congratulations. And Chancellor, thank you so very, very much. Thank you. <laughs>